off we go. So, Rob, thanks for getting on to this author interview. Sounds very formal, doesn't it? Uh, so just for the sake of uh, anyone and uh, everyone watching, uh, we'll just start off with easy questions. The hard ones come later on. Uh, I was like, can you state your name? It sounds like you're, you're, uh, you're up, you're up <laughs> in like, front of... Uh, sounds like I've done something terrible, yeah. State your name for the record. Um, so just let us know your, your full name, where you were born, where you were brought up, and where you live now as well, just to create that geographical context. Yeah, my name is Rob Drummond. Uh, I was born on the Wivel, which is the other side of the Mersey to Liverpool. Um, so I grew up there and it's one of those things where when you grew up on the Wivel, like we view Liverpool as like another place because it's, a, it's over the other side of the Mersey. But as soon as you travel further away than say, you know, Chester, like you're all just Scousers basically. So I'm... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so I grew up a sort of fake Scouser, plastic Scouser, I guess, and then um, moved over to Sheffield for university. So I uh, now live in the middle of England, a bit higher up than you, um, over the hills. Uh, so I came to Sheffield to study and just really like it here. Found um, great culture, great beer, um, great walks, great, great, great running routes, um, which is kind of why we're, st why we're still here, I guess. Wonderful. And, and how would someone who knows you well, uh, not, not me, someone else, uh, how do you think they might describe Rob Drummond in a sentence or two? How might someone else describe Rob Drummond? Um, a, a man of dogged mystery. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, it's, like, it's like, well, I'm definitely principled in terms of the work that I do keeps coming back to certain principles. It keeps coming back to the principles of communication, the principles of trust. Um, I'm always trying to get down to the things that matter. You know, when you when you strip away tactics and fads and all of these shiny objects that come and go, I'm always trying to get down to what are the fundamental building blocks of trust. Um, and that's 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 really what my work is all about. So, so I think I'm principled. Um, I'm always trying to strip away and get to fundamental things. Uh, I also really believe that actually real insights come from m multiple fields of expertise. I think there's a great tendency at the moment to kind of, you know, pretty much view any aspect of life in, in, in silos, whether that's in science, whether you're looking at physics and biology and chemistry. And what we've learned from science in the last 50 years is that they all relate. You know, when you get down to quantum level stuff, it's all the same. And I think... I think we see that in marketing as well. There's a great tendency to split it by Facebook ads, Google ads, email marketing. Actually, when you strip these things away, there are certain threads that run across all of them. So, so yeah. So how, I'm, would you um, I'm, uh, how would you summarize all that in a in a single sentence? Pursuer of truth. Pursuer of, um, you know, I, I'm always asking, like, well, what what's when you strip away all of the marketing fads, what what is still going to be here in a hundred years? Um, I think storytelling is like still going to be here in a hundred years. I think humans are still going to be telling stories. I think we're still going to be building connections. I still, I think we're still going to be building communities and seeking out communities. And what is your chapter in the Six Star Business Book about? My chapter is about how to create a six star pre-sales experience by telling your story and specifically by telling your true authentic story so not not the version of the story that you see on people's facebook feeds where it's them standing in front of a helicopter that they've hired or in front of a sports car that they borrowed for the day and it, it's a sub story about you know how they were broken on that down to the last tin of beans and for, you know, just the exchange of your email address, they'll share a simple five-step system to enable <laughs> you to achieve the same thing. It's, it's sharing your true authentic story and how you got to doing what you do today, how you came to develop your expertise, sharing that with, with potential customers so that they really understand what you do and understand your, understand your uniqueness. And actually that creates a completely different pre-sales experience to just when you subscribe to someone's email list, and they hammer you over and over with naggy sales emails, basically. So uh, we talk about that in the chapter.
Mm. And when you, when you think about a reader going through your chapter and getting to the end, what impact do you hope to create by being an author in this six-star business book? I want to make it, I want people to read the chapter and have storytelling go from being a uh, sort of icing on the cake, a sort of nice to have, to realizing that actually telling your story is a potentially, for the right type of business, it's a really important growth lever that can take your business from one, from one level to the next. And actually, if you sell based on trust, if you sell based on expertise, and if you're not telling your story, there's actually quite an obvious growth lever here that once you start telling your story effectively, you build trust with potential customers way more efficiently. So wow. the outcome is that it should be a real priority. So by reading the chapter, I think actually ha developing a real desire to tell your authentic story and place it higher up the priority list because it, it's like one of those things otherwise it's like it's important but not urgent so it always just sits on the to-do list so, oh yeah i'll create an email sequence i'll create an email sequence to go out to new subscribers like we all know that's important but it gets buried under the need to do more pressing things to fix a facebook ads campaign that's blown up or to fix something else that's blown up and it has to i think once you once you realize the business case for it and I state a couple of cases in, in the chapter, both in my business and from clients' businesses that have been completely transformed by the process of telling an authentic story, then it, sh it, should, it, should, elevate, it should elevate your desire to go and tell your story in your own marketing. Yeah, that sounds really powerful. And, and when, when, you, when you go from that kind of overall impact down to like a, perhaps a single actionable idea or uh, an aha moment or, or a practical step that someone could take specifically after reading a chapter, what, what, what might that be? A single aha moment or a single practical step after reading my chapter. Slightly, it's slightly tricky because obviously the process of telling your story isn't just like a, a simple fix. It isn't just something that you're going to go and it's not a switch that you can flick, but you could definitely get started. It's, and one of the things that I illustrate in the chapter is you don't have to be a professional copywriter to do this. You have a voice, you are human, you are a, you are a natural storyteller. We're all, natural, we're all natural storytellers. It's just that, you know, the Western education system teaches us to be rational and all of these things, and we kind of forget the art of storytelling but you are a storyteller and you can do this. You can tell your story in an engaging way and in a, in a way, in a business setting that is interesting to potential business clients. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so by the end of the chapter, the one action is that you should, you should feel like you should be able to get started. Excellent. And um, you're a, you are a writer. Uh, you, you write every day. Uh, both for yourself and your clients. You have already written a, a, at least two books that I know of uh, on Amazon. Uh, so how how was writing a chapter for How to Be a Six-Star Business book different from uh, other writing that, you, uh, that, that you've done in the past? How, how did you feel writing your chapter? Well, I'm a very impulsive writer. I, I tend to, you know, once I get in a, an idea in my head, and I like to write in coffee shops, I like to I like to write away from my away from my desk. I like to edit at my desk, but I like to write in coffee shops. So I like to go to coffee shops early in the morning, maybe half, maybe not half five, but maybe like six, half six in the morning, and you know for like three hours, just like really write quite intensely. So that's what I did for the six star business book. I I um I kind of poured my soul into that in quite a short time frame um and every, every writer's every writer's difference i've got i've got writers in my in my writer's circle who you know spend an hour on it leave it to sit spend an hour on it leave it to sit um so i'd say actually in in many respects it was kind of it was kind of similar to the writing that i teach and writing that i've done in the past my own my own way of doing it is you know, I get an idea in my head and I disappear in the cave for a while and I don't come out, I don't come out till it's done. Um, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of my books earlier. I think um, 
both of the times I've self-published books, I actually wrote the book in a month because I get the idea to write it and I think that's it. It gets, it gets, it's like a worm in my brain. That, mm. But, you know, that's, that's, that's just, you know, I, I think that's, that's one of the, that's one of the ways that, that you know that you're, that you're a writer, I guess, is that, is that you get an idea in your brain and you, you go into your cave and you want to just write about it until it, until it fully forms itself in a way that's really, mm. really useful to other people. Mm, I can relate to that. Uh, and when, when you think about all of the aspects of writing in a business context that you, you could have written about, what was it specifically about that creating a six-star experience in the pre-sales uh, process or environment that, um, you know, what, what inspired you to write on that particular topic? I think because it's the, it's the most, it's the biggest bleeding neck if I was to, for all of the clients that I work with, if I was to identify one thing that is the, it's the theory of bottlenecks, isn't it? You know, in, in every situation, there's a, there's a bottleneck somewhere. And that's the thing that you work on first. And for me, the clients that I work with, they're normally generating new opt-ins. They normally already have a traffic source. The traffic source could be Google ads. It could be networking. It could be Facebook ads. It could, it could be anything. They have an end product. They have the membership site. They have the webinars. They have all of the stuff further down. But when people opt in, there's a there's often a disparity of experience between between the very first interaction where people get quite excited to work with this person, and then the emails just let them down. Like the emails are just naggy sales emails. And I think I think we've all I think we've all subscribed to people's email lists. And how often do most people email you? sporadically um, when they have a sale on. Um, so for me, you know, telling your story, sending out a great email sequence when people first op opt in, that's, it's normally the biggest hole. Because actually, if you, can, if you can tell an authentic story in that sequence and really build some trust, people will stay subscribed to your emails for quite a long time, even if, even if after that, you don't you don't email them very often, or you for a while you only email them when you have a sale on, which I don't recommend that you fall back to. But if that's the case, the fact that you sent a great email sequence up front, like you've already poured cement around the around the relationship with that with that subscriber, they will cut you slack for any marketing failings that that inevitably come because we're all humans, so we all have marketing failings. Um, so for me, it's 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 usually the biggest bottleneck for people that sell based on expertise. That's a, a lovely concept, pouring cement around the, the relationship. Um, Rob, a, a couple of questions that um, should hopefully put you in a, in a reflective uh, mode, kind of just looking back on your, on your path, your journey to where you are now. What would you say has been the, the greatest gift to you, the greatest reward that you've received on your journey? The greatest gift to me, the greatest reward that I've received on my journey so far. I think, I think potentially, um, I think just from a personal growth perspective, um, having two premature babies. I, I think I'm, I think I'm a more mature human with a better perspective on life, and I'm, I'm a better writer for the challenges that I've been through as a result of that. Um, I also have a more, a much more, a very acute awareness of the passing of time because I only have a limited amount of time in the day, uh, and uh, I think actually it's been a gift. So yes, m my time available to work on the business and work on clients has diminished, but my appreciation for that time has gone up. Um, and I think actually the fact that both of those births had challenging elements, uh, especially the second one because my daughter was born literally on the day that the pub shut when lockdown happened in 2020 and she was born eight she was born eight weeks early and spent five weeks in hospital and i was just at home with my son for five weeks um being a full-time single dad mm -hmm. um and actually I've, i know i now view it as a gift because i think it's i think it forced me to kind of grow as a dad grow as a person mm -hmm. um and i think i think you know that that translates into my business work as well you know, like, I don't think you can sort of 
distinguish between personal growth, personal challenges, and you know, the, the business output that you're capable of as well. It's interesting, Rob, because one of my other questions is, again, in that reflective mode, what would you say is uh, one of, if not the greatest challenge that you've faced on your journey? And it sounds to me that the, the, they're the same thing, would you say? Yeah, I think 2020 was, and I think it was just so circumstantial to do with the birth of my daughter, her being in hospital for five weeks. So when my daughter was born, uh, yeah, because I had a two, so my son was two, and I couldn't work because I was looking after him all day. Or No, I could work, but I could only work between five and six in the morning and between eight and ten at night, and maybe if you had a nap at lunch. And then we'd go into hospital once a day, we'd swap over with the kids, so I'd have an hour or two with Rumo, and then my wife would have an hour or two with Hugo. And, you know, I think when you're in it at the time, you just kind of, day by day, you just get through it. And, you know, we, we didn't have any support because my family is in, in Liverpool, and, you know, we, we live in Sheffield. And, um, you know, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, you just work through it. But I think, yeah, I think looking back, that's that's been the greatest challenge and you know I, th I think it's it kind of solidified my wife and I working as a team working in collaboration because that was that was that was how we had to do it um and I, I, it's funny when you talk to people about their stories of lockdown like this like I think everyone has some kind of story like this like it's so fascinating hmm. whether that was just kids at home homeschooling kids all of these all of these things that have happened um you know I think I think Perhaps, perhaps even if it's not you directly. Equally, I've got I've got single friends with no kids who just like learn learn new hobbies, and I I hate them quite a lot. But you know, <laughs> but 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 they didn't have the same personal growth opportunities as I had. So yeah, and and just uh, thinking about personal growth and uh, the skills that you've developed on your on your journey and your path. What would you say is one of the most important skills that you've developed? Uh, perhaps either an innate skill that you've nurtured or or one that you've recognised that you needed to develop. Uh, on your journey i think i think my skill is kind of i think the skill that i've developed is the skill as an interviewer so my copywriting process is really about interviewing clients taking their words and repurposing reorganizing their words into a narrative into a prose into a format that's going to build trust and generate sales um and actually i've realized over the last few years that there was a bit of nuance to that as an interviewer because it's not just like you're like like for you in, interviewing me. It's not just like you're throwing questions at me and I'm, I'm I'm spitting out the answer. There's a bit of back and forth. There's a bit of to and throw. Um, and I'm, I'm not trained. As, I'm not trained as, as 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 an interviewer. It's just a part of my job that actually is quite important. And I think that's had to come. I think I've had to work on that quite a lot. I think um, in my work, what I've what I've always done really well is say I've got you know, the interview that I've done with a client. And what I'm really good at is pouring through it, pulling out threads. I'm good at seeing threads across quite large amounts of data. So if you tell me your life story, you tell me 20 years of your past, I can see actually there's threads that run through it, common threads. And actually it's those threads that we took on to create narrative and to build trust with that narrative because your potential customers also, also share the same threads. They share the mm -hmm. same concerns. So by sharing yours, you're building connection with with them having been through your process i can attest to that skill that you uh, that you possess uh, so the last question then rob is around being six star and what it means to you personally and why you consider it to be so important i think i think striving for excellence is what are my values i'm 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 not a plotter and I don't really work with, at least not on a long-term basis, I don't really work with clients who are also just trying to make a living or trying to do something standard. What is really interesting to me is when a client is, in their own unique way, they are trying to change the lives of someone for the better. So for me, yes, I want to achieve that as well, but I, I, I am helping my clients to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm increasing the impact that someone is having through their work. And that to me is what is part of what being six star is about. It's, it's 
helping people to achieve a transformation and, and, and allowing more people who need that to have access to it. And part of that is to do with communication and understanding what's available and communicating your values to people, you know. So it's, it's, it's facilitating that, basically. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your, your help and support of uh, the book and the movement and uh, for your contribution, obviously, your, your chapter and, uh, and your time this afternoon. It's been yeah, good talking great. to you. Thanks, please.